Hey guys, welcome to By the Horns. Um, in this episode, we were joined by Stackmore Hoddle. Stackmore is a Turkish resident who lives in Turkey, and we had him on the show to chat about his experiences of the inflationary scenario that's unfolding in Turkey, the reasons for it, the level of government corruption that's driving it behind all the monetary policy decisions, um, and all of the cancelling effects that come with it, and what we as South Africans can do to prepare ourselves for the inflation that is inevitably going to come to us because we follow a very similar system of governance to what's happening in Turkey. So a very interesting conversation. Uh, I think it's one you guys are going to enjoy quite a lot. Before we get into that, though, we've got a couple of ads I want to get through. Now, how we work on By the Horns is we don't get paid for ads. We find Bitcoin projects in South Africa that we really like and that we want to support and that we advertise them on the show. So first one, if you want to buy any corporate gear, if you want to buy cool T-shirts, hoodies, have them made for your company, like I got this one over here, go to Mystic Turtle. Mystic Turtle accepts Bitcoin. So uh, they've got BTC Pay service set up. You can pay in sats nice and easy. And they're big Bitcoiners over there and they make cool stuff. So check them out. Second up, we've got Exonumia. So Exonumia is a Bitcoin trans open source translation project. So what they're trying to achieve is translate seminal Bitcoin works into native African languages. So if you can speak Zulu, Peri, Tsonga, Koza, Afrikaans, head over there and start contributing. Why not translate the Bitcoin standard into Afrikaans? That's great. Also, they need some sats to be able to pay for translators. So if you want to support the project, send some sats over to them. They'd really appreciate that. Then we've got the Surfer Kids slash Bitcoin Ikasi. Um, this is the two projects in one. What they do is they teach kids how to surf, about personal responsibility. If these kids keep coming back for years, learning how to surf every day. They then get promoted to coaches, um, and then they start paying them in sats. And then these kids are now part of the Bitcoin Ikasi project where they're trying to emulate Bitcoin Beach and they go back into the townships where they live and they're bringing merchants on board to accept Bitcoin because the kids are being paid in Bitcoin. They want to be able to spend the Bitcoin somewhere. So you end up with a circular economy forming. Really, really cool project. If you've got skills you want to contribute, like how to set up lightning nodes, uh, spin up BTC pay servers, help merchant adoption, they really need help on that side of things. But also if you want to contribute, send some sats to them. They can really put it to good use. Next up, we've got Crypto Convert. Basically put, you can buy electricity via Lightning. Pretty cool if you're living on the Bitcoin standard. Everyone needs power. They're the only guys in the country who do this right now for prepaid meters. Go over there, pay in sats, get your electricity coupon sent your number. And then finally, this show is proudly brought to you by Bitvice, my company, my, well, myself and Brandon's company. What we do is we're the only platform in South Africa where you can get self-custody only Bitcoin. What it means, you set up a profile with us, you link your bank account, you buy your Bitcoin, we send it directly to your self-custody. We focus on how to set up multi-sigs, hardware wallets, etc. cetera, whatever's relevant to you, your consultation services as well. And we've got some very cool products coming soon. The only self-custody sat stack of product in South Africa. Go check us out, bitvice.io. All right, guys, onto the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to By the Horns, a Bitcoin podcast about South Africa. And tonight we're joined by Stackmore Huddle, straight out of Turkey. Stackmore, welcome to the show. Super glad to have you here. Yeah, hi Ricky. I'm also be I'm also happy to be here. And we we had a small chat before the show actually, which was really interesting. So hopefully we had a half a half a podcast before the show. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> we'll be able to reflect some of that to the audience as well. But we'll see. Yeah, I'm sure. Good, man. So the reason why we got you on the show is to chat about what the hell is going on in Turkey. Obviously, inflation in Turkey is kicking off. Erdogan is, you know, running it like his personal fiefdom. And there's a lot of parallels between South Africa. So I'm really interested to find out from you on the ground what's happening in Turkey, what's going on in the monetary policy, and why is inflation so hectic, and how does Bitcoin fix this? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I think uh, it all starts with the... I mean, so a couple of years ago, we had like a referendum and the people decided to choose a system where we have a president. Before that, we didn't have that. We had a prime minister and all that stuff, but no presidency. So, yeah, Mr. Erdogan wanted to be like the only person responsible of the country. And then he kind of like took people to the referendum and it passed. So... Uh, one of his promises was like, just give me the power and then I'll show you guys how to deal with the dollar and inflation and high cost of living, you know. And yeah, back when he said this, uh, one dollar was for Turkish liras. Now, one dollar is 
six or something Turkish lira. So like over three times uh, when he got the power. And like, you know, there were there was a lot of opposition to him, like when he wanted the presidency. Uh, because like there are a lot of cases in the world that uh, you can see uh, that there are problems with uh, a one person led government. Like, for example, my favorite one is the most ironic one is the Democratic Republic of Congo. You are probably more aware of it because, you know, like the name is Democratic Republic, but like, uh, I don't know, they are being led by someone for a long time and like in 2017 if i'm not wrong they were uh they said we don't have any money to go on with an election so i'll just stay being in power you know so that was that that's a uh, example and i think right now the president of turkey is being active very active in managing the monetary policy of turkey like uh he is you know, kicking out uh, the central bank managers, he's changing the Ministry of Finance and doing all these kind of stuff. Actually, this morning, uh, we, we woke up to a new Minister of Finance, you know, because the other one supposedly resigned, but in here, you don't really resign, you know. Like, he just says, okay, you are good to go now, you know, I'll replace you with someone else or something, you know. And the, this guy uh, who is the minister of finance right now has no economic background like you know like they were in textile business and all that stuff but you know not, nothing with economics and actually i read an article about him from 2006 and his brother was saying well we are kind of jealous of china because uh, they can employ people for 60 dollars and uh, a month at a minimum wage and we cannot do that and this is making us lose our competitive advantage and blah, blah, blah. And 15 years later, the minimum wage is $200 in Turkey right now. Uh, and actually, like over 45% of the population earns a minimum wage, which is horrible. And life is not too cheap. It's cheap if you are an expat or, you know, from somewhere else. But like, if you want to survive in Turkey, life is not cheap at the moment. So basically, that's the situation. So that's very similar to South Africa, right? I mean, our minimum wage is probably about 4,000 Rand, maybe 5,000 Rand, which is $300 thereabouts a month. Um, so it's if you South African, life is not cheap. But if you are in, in expats or if you're earning globally, then it's very cheap. But the you know the parallels between South Africa and Turkey are striking you know we've got similar levels of of um, dollar denominated debt we've got you know similar mm -hmm. gdp well actually i might be speaking under correction there. i don't actually know um but we definitely have similar levels of corruption <laughs> going on between yeah. south africa and turkey um but what we don't have yet is we don't have the levels of inflation that you guys are seeing and that's probably because we've got a semi uh, independent central bank still well an independent central bank. South Africa's out of all of our institutions that have failed, our reserve bank has managed to stay independent. But it's a matter of time until it gets politicized. And and as I understand it, what's happened to the Turkish central bank is that it has been politicized and has now become a tool under the control of Erdogan and, and his party. Is, is that yeah. correct? Simply like, uh, you know, when the inf one of the times uh, that kicked off the inflation was when the President Erdogan appointed his son-in-law as the minister of finance and then uh, his son-in-law's friend was the head of central banking uh, and then yeah things started to get weirder and weirder yeah <laughs> now it's we, we can't i don't i think it's at a point where you can't stop it and actually like i told you a couple minutes before uh, we had a new minister of finance nobody else really wanted to have the job because, you know, you first of all, even though if you understood the principle of economics and how when you are uh, dependent on foreign goods to produce things, you know, like or when your exports are uh, lower than your imports, it's really bad to have a high foreign currency like like uh, or when your money loses value against the foreign currency, it means everything will be priced higher. 
And unfortunately, we are not self-dependent. You know, we we need a lot of stuff. Uh, we need to buy a lot of stuff. And the, you know, this was also a process. It took years. And instead of building industry and you know doing production, uh, the government over the years wanted to incentivize uh, house, uh, you know, house building or housing sector you know like so they built apartments yeah, like construction infra infrastructure yeah construction and it's the reason why they incentivized is that it's uh yeah it's also another way of printing money because you make more land available and then you give high uh you know floors per, high floor permits for the land and so the constructor can just you know, show the land, get some credit from the bank against it, and then start building it. And while building it, they can also sell it, you know. But this, of course, causes a bubble, and then you get like, you know, uh, you don't get ghost towns like they do in China with Evergrande, because like uh, most of the construction is done in Istanbul, and like, you know, so. And in Istanbul, there are not huge lands that you can build like mega projects like that. But instead of it, like they built, uh, yeah, normally not permitted buildings in places with which has a lot of value. Like for example, like uh, this region close to the old airport Ataköy, uh, they there were no buildings over seven floors over there, and then. Yeah, they started to go like 30 stories, 40 stories high buildings, you know. And at the end, by the way, they closed the airport, which was like a you know, pretty well-functioning airport. And they opened up a new airport uh, in Istanbul, a huge airport. It's like thought to be the biggest airport in the world. And of course, like the construction was made by the friends of the government and yeah it was a big budget and uh, the government banks aided that you know with cheap credit and on top of that uh, they gave guarantees to the constructors that there will be this many passengers that will use this airport and they will pay you this much per usage and if it's under that uh, the government will be the one who pays for the missing part so yeah. So in, in let's just discuss the scenario where that what you just said makes sense. Because why would the government assign an agreement with a private company to say, okay, cool, we'll we'll guarantee you a certain minimum amount of um of, of people coming through the airport? Or in the article you wrote in Bitcoin magazine, you mentioned a couple of bridges that have been built where they guarantee amount of certain amount of cars that'll cross the bridge. And if you don't hit those targets, the government will stand guarantee and they'll pay in. This only makes sense in a in a corrupt society where there's backhand deals going on, where obviously the government has been paid off by those companies and then they give them, you know, a friendly yeah. treatment. And obviously there's a revolving door between those companies and the government, right? Like the, the regulators go and join the board of those companies, their shareholders, you know, then they appoint members of those companies to uh, positions in power to then be able to grant these these um, tenders in South Africa, but but like building permits, I, I presume this is this is what happens in Turkey, right? Yeah, of like the bridges, for example. Like, okay, I could understand if the bridge was a necessity and that had to be done, you know, like, and let's say it wasn't too feasible. Okay, then the government could maybe do some subsidies, which I'm really against subsidies because it destroys the free market by itself you know but in this case the guarantees are like over the charts it's like they are unnecessary so much like you know the bridge pays pay itself back in four years and the company is allowed to run it for 20 years for example you know and also the the worst part is uh, the guarantees are made with foreign exchange uh, money. Like, so a couple of the bridges are paid in uh, dollars. And, you know, I think like recently Euro was doing better. So this last bridge they got, they have a deal with Euro, you know. So, yeah. And for example, there was this airport. 
and it was also given guarantees and all that stuff. And it cost, I don't know, 20 million euros to build it. It was like a smaller airport. They hit the target by 98.5%. There was only one flight taking off from that airport of, in a week. <laughs> like 98.5%. Like, you know, it's like, it's impossible. Mm. They, they, so hang on. They, so the airport's not, not being nice. used at all. No. There was no planning. That there was no accurate planning. There was no need. In other words, there was no, 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 no um, market demand. Mm -hmm. But they built the airport just because it was there's a contract to be had, basically. Yeah. So basically, this airport is located in Kütahya, which is like in between, like there's Izmir, uh, my city. There's Ankara and there's Istanbul. They are like the three biggest cities. And this city is kind of in between them. So people could use all those airports. But they opened up an airport there and it's only being used for one flight from Kütahya to Bruges. That's it. And all the that, reason why... Bruges tourism. <laughs> yeah, but okay. It kind of makes sense to why it's Bruges because there are a lot of uh, immigrants from that city that moved to... Belgium back in the days or whatever, you know, so, but still, you know, it's just one flight. It's, it's crazy. It's like, yeah. and the corruption, actually, the corruption knows no bounds, you know, there's no shame. They have no shame at all. Yeah. Th that's the thing though. Like, you know, uh, being shameless, like if you want to be corrupt, you have to be shameless. Like that's the only, uh, yeah characteristic that you need to have you know everything else will be fine whatever you know but if you are not shameless you cannot be corrupt basically so it's yeah but politics kind of selects for people who have no shame you know it's it's yeah. unfortunately the way it works also they pick the guilty ones like for example they can the, control them yeah like the president of turkey right now erdogan's son uh, killed uh, an opera singer while Erdogan was still at. Uh, he was just a mayor. He was the mayor of Istanbul. So they hid it, like literally. That he was. He didn't have a license or something, or you know, like. And he literally hit the woman and killed her with the car. And they sent uh, fire trucks to clear off the brake marks and all that stuff. And then he was let go. Like, you know, they let him go. So, yeah, he owed people favors. And I really hate this about politics, like, because people who owe people favors are being placed to places, you know? So, yeah, that was like... I mean, yeah, we, we were talking uh, before this started about, about Ghislaine Maxwell, but this is essentially how Jeffrey Epstein had his, like, web of influence, right? Yeah. It's yeah. about, it's through owing favors. And if you get a politician to bang someone who's, like, 17, but she mm -hmm. looks like she's 19 or 20, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, this girl's underage. Now you've got dirt on Prince Andrew, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and then and all of a sudden they owe favors. Well, well, you are already guilty. This is a 16-year-old one. Should be fine. And, you know, it's it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a dirty game, man. It's a, a dirty game, and 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 this is the thing, right? People think they can reform the system, but they fail uh -huh. to understand that the system itself is it, it cannot be reformed because you you're creating incentives that just that just provide evil with an environment to thrive in, um, and the system can't be saved. You know, the fiat fiat system creates so many perverse outcomes that obviously this is what you're going to get. You're going to get like the stratified gamified society where those who have power will just keep increasing it. And those that don't will keep losing power and the Cancellian effect, you know, and call it the Gini coefficient if you want to be mm -hmm. woke about it, but Cancellian effect, this, this is what it creates, you know? I mean, but I think no matter what happens at some point, power, uh, yeah, just goes into one direction in a way. Like even even with a gold standard or like a future Bitcoin standard, because there will always be some more productive ones that or ones that take better care of their wealth and that stuff. It, it's inevitable. Uh, Cantillon effect just like makes it faster uh, than the natural curve, and 
yeah so uh, maybe this would happen in like five or six generations in a gold standard or bitcoin standard but it happens like in my life i i saw the cantle and effect work like you know it, it happens through one's life cycle and you know it's also okay that you know wealth can be focused on uh, some part of the population if it gets too focused on it eventually redistributes this always happened like and actually i was listening to this podcast uh, that was shot in 2019 it's like ancient greece classified or yeah some something like that i like that podcast it talks about ancient greece uh, and there was a professor there and he was actually talking about how uh, wealth redistribution happens with wars and uh, by pandemics in 2019 and right now i I think we are really ready for a wealth distribution, uh, but they want to front run it and do it as they wish to see it happen, you know? So they don't want the wealth distribution run its normal course. They want to control people and then, you know, act like distributing it a little maybe, but keep the power at themselves and add more control limits to the population. You know so we here talking about South Africa and Turkey and the Kantilian effects we see in our own countries. People must realize those same incentives and forces play out on a global scale. You know, the Kantilian effect, if it applies in South Africa and Turkey, it applies in the US, it applies at the UN, you know, it applies at the world level. Um, and if you listen to Laser Huddle speak about focus on monetary resets, in my mind, that's exactly what's going on. You know, in 2008, they kicked the can down the road. The mm -hmm. system would, was broken then again. They had a chance to maybe save it. They chose to print money, obviously, because that's what governments always do. They take the, 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 the easier routes out. Austerity is not popular. Um, and they, they print money and they can't stop it. It's mathematically impossible. Um, mm -hmm. So the system is fucked. The system is going to collapse. They've got to keep printing money. And, and what I think we're seeing is a controlled demolition of the, of the global economy. And what I really worry about I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here, but whatever, what I really worry about is that the the unseen forces behind this that are driving this, that are, you know, so insistent on only one solution to the, the pandemic problem being, you know, getting yourself injected. <laughs> that's the only solution, even though there's a bunch of other, you know, repurposed drugs and a, and a bunch of other alternatives you can go for, like not being fat and, you know, eating healthily and exercising and all that stuff. It's all of those. Those are ignored. Um, obviously, that is a looting of the current system. Extract as much wealth as you can from this current system, and you look at the likes of the you know the top ten biggest companies in the world that are, their their wealth has just ballooned through the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. while everyone else has you know lost a lot of money. But then they're going to try to shift to a new system, which you know you and I understand to be CBDCs is most likely yes. what they're going to move CBDC. towards. You know. Um, so an implosion of this system and at the CBDCs will be at a global level. So an SDR backed CBDC, you know, like the, the IMF will have their special drawing rights to basket of currencies with a CBDC linked to it. Um, and it seems clear as daylight to me that like this is what's happening. And what I worry about is that the what they're trying to produce is civil war widespread around the globe, people at each other's throats, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated fighting each other. So they can swoop in, the globalists can swoop in, the UN, the World Economic Forum can swoop in and be like, hey guys, we've got a problem, we've got a solution here, calm down, we just need order, and that order can only come from a world government, and here's the world money, the CBDC, I don't know, yeah. am I crazy? No, I, I agree, so, like, actually, you know, like, recently, okay, so the, one of the reasons why the Turkish lira is suffering is because, you know, we have a, let's say, you announce a CPI level of 20%, you know. So that means that your money is losing 20% of its purchasing power in a year. So if the interest rate is below 20 or 19%, it means you are losing 1% of your savings when you put your money in interest. So in Turkey, uh, in October, the last uh, announced CPI was 19.89%. So close to 20%. 
but the interest rates are at 15 percent because the president opened the war against high interest rates because he thinks it's the interest lobby or he's trying to convey the message that yeah, there's an interest lobby that's feeding on high interest rates and making money like that, blah, blah, blah. You know, so he said, ah, okay, I I have a war against this. And it's also like not very, very suitable with Islam and all that stuff too, you know, like because he has to sprinkle uh, things about Islam and being a Muslim or whatever because it worked in the past for him. So, yeah. You get that. So, yeah, any political points you can, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But it's funny though, like, you know, like let's say it's a sin to take interest at 20%. Is it less of a sin if you take interest at 15%? It's still the same shit, you know? It's like... Do you think Allah's got a book where he's like, okay, 15% yeah, yeah. is better than 20, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you had an F for, you know, now you get a D in your grade book or whatever, you know? It's like... Yeah, so it's 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 a joke, but uh, anyhow, so uh, you know he knows that by doing this, he's literally stealing people's purchasing power, and like if you want to go to an election, which we have elections in two thousand twenty three, so not too far away, you know, but I think we'll have early elections anyways, but you you cannot. Uh, have dissatisfied 50% of the population, at least, you know. And so uh, this doesn't make sense to me, you know. And uh, here I sometimes, uh, recently I started to think that he wants chaos. Like, and pe interestingly, people are acting really calm and like nobody is really doing any protests or anything, but I think he is chasing chaos. And yeah, in here it will be chaos because of like his supporters and people who can't make a living. And maybe in uh, uh, Austria it will be a chaos between people who are forcing vaccination mandates and who are against vaccination mandates. And uh, yeah, once the economic wheel stops, uh, they'll be like, well, we need CBDCs and in order to get this, you need to comply to this and the list will just get longer and longer. So it's yep. interesting. I, I totally agree with you on that. And I also agree with Laser Hodel. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so what's interesting to me is that you and I talked about this before the show started. Like we have a lot of freedom through incompetence, both in South yeah. Africa and Turkey, because we've got incompetent governments. Thank God, you know. Because yes. we we could we could be living in Australia right now or Austria having yeah. a cuck time. No good. You know, trade offs so, are everywhere, right? Trade yeah, offs trade -offs are everywhere. everywhere. Like you know, we have incompetent yeah. governments, so have a failed monetary system and you know corruption. But we have some sort of a freedom because of the incompetence. And if you're on a if you're on a Bitcoin standard, it's not so bad. You know, like yeah. I live in personally, I live in what I think is one of the greatest cities on earth. Uh, Cape Town, fantastic place. I'm on a Bitcoin standard, so you know, whatever. Yeah. Obviously, we are so similar, by the way. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, absolutely. Think, yeah. Absolutely. I think. I think the parallels between Turkey and South Africa are are, are very very strong. Um, you know, where where you can live a really good life, um, mm -hmm. if you if you just opt out. You know, you can just opt out mm -hmm. of this madness. But then. In other countries, first world countries, my fiance is British, right? Like she doesn't want to go back to the UK. Uh, we don't want to go back to the UK because like we don't want to go to prison. You know, like it's effectively what the country is becoming now um, where you don't have freedom of movement. You don't have, which is tangentially the country that invented the concept of liberty, which is the UK. It's not America. Like the UK I, I, came I, I, up with that. Magna Carta, all of that. Like that shit doesn't matter. They are tearing that up. That shit doesn't matter anymore. So like, the, the forces of authoritarianism and tyranny are really strong right now. Um, but what I see in places like Turkey and South Africa is you've got these regional squabbles going on, power struggles internally, and how much sway the globalists can have over those politics 
sure they can have yeah. some you know gates gates foundation donates a lot of money in south africa to all kinds of different causes you know um, mm -hmm. we've got several media media houses that are funded by the gates foundation and etc so you, they do have you, want, you, you want to have a place that produces bugs and turns them into animal feed oh yeah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. i used, to, I used fund, to work in that industry actually yeah i used to talk about think about that too because we we have like dairy cows and yeah, my family yep. does agriculture. So yes. I was thinking of that at some point because there was this no cannibalism law for chicken or whatever. So I was like, oh, maybe we could do maggots for, to feed the chicken, yes. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a company called Agri Protein here in Cape Town that does, they breed flies on food waste. Um, yeah. And then they Black make salt the maggots. Yeah, and then they feed that to the chickens, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, great. As long as I'm not eating the bugs, it's fine. I'm not in the party eating it's, the bugs. It's, it's cool. actually better than eat them, the chicken eating soy protein, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, because that's yeah. what a chicken would normally eat is is fly yeah. larvae. Um, I got no problem with that. Anyway, as long as they're not feeding it to me. But yes. uh, in um, what I find interesting is is the the regional power dynamics that are at play and the global power dynamics, like how much control do the globalists really have, you know? And this is the this is the interesting thing, de facto, like on the ground. So Erdogan's got his, he's got his own agenda and then he's got the globalists, the World Economic Forum, et cetera, exerting pressure on him. Like where, 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 do, where do the, how does the, how you does the balance go? Interesting thing. Uh, so I think two days ago, he had a speech about economy and inflation and how he wants to proceed. And, I think it's the first time I heard him say the Turkish version of Great Reset. It was Dad. like... Yeah. Did he say build back better? Yeah, no, not really. But he said like Great Reset, literally, you know, like yeniden başlatma, so starting over again. And was interesting. Great Reset, Great Reset, terms and conditions apply. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. the small, small... Yeah, font. Yeah. <laughs> you'll learn nothing, you'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, these fuckers are everywhere. And and obviously, for, for us Bitcoiners, it's, um, I don't want to say it's plain to see, but we see through the bullshit more than others because a prerequisite for being into Bitcoin means you have to have seen something wrong in conventional fiat. And that's why you went looking for mm -hmm. a solution, you know? And me personally, I came through gold and then I found Bitcoin um because gold like the original you know orange pill gold mm -hmm. pill for me yeah. um thank you peter schiff actually i was oh, like really? this guy makes a lot of sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. especially nice. you know the, on that's how i came in from the gold side and then i learned about bitcoin and i was like oh this is you know solves a lot of problems yeah and now peter schiff i uh, i don't know we have i don't know I, I think peter schiff is full of shit i think he's buying bitcoin and I he's selling got, gold yeah he's yeah, got yeah. The, you know you know like he's got he's a businessman so doing businessman things. So who knows? No, it's like um, for me, I personally started to buy Bitcoin to get my money out of or to get my country out of my money, you know? So basically. Yeah, exactly. And so so what's the situation in Turkey with Bitcoin adoption? Um, you know, are people buying Bitcoin as an inflation hedge because they're seeing inflation happening or is it still quite underground? So, Turkey has a really good history with gold. Like, traditionally, we keep gold. We give gold at weddings, at circumcision yeah. ceremonies, you know, like, and all that stuff. <laughs> Actually, give and, like... Give and take. Yeah. <laughs> no, really, like, uh, the first Bitcoin I bought, I bought it by selling my tip. <laughs> <laughs> and this is paraphrasing from... Uh, GG, by the way, because uh, that was a very <laughs> funny conversation and it led it to sell the tip, buy the dip, and all that stuff. <laughs> it was him and bank off money. It was an interesting night. But really, like, uh, I sold my tip and bought the dip. Like, that's how I, to get my money, to get my country out of my money, you know? So also at weddings, we give like gold all the time, I, which I'm not doing it for the last like four years. I give Bitcoin to people and it actually worked on some, like actually orange pill them because yeah, they see the number go up and then 
yeah, they get attracted to it over time and then they start to understand it. So this friend, uh, before the conversation that I told you about my friend who's in my house right now, so he didn't get married and, you know, <laughs> and I couldn't give him a Bitcoin gift and he's not orange peeled yet. But not joking <laughs> aside, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. But I mean, what, what do you think the percentage adoption is? Like how many people, I mean, I read your article earlier about how many people are, are, are trading Bitcoin in, in Turkey, more than the stock exchange, right? Like more than double people are, yeah, that are trading yeah. stocks. So actually, like Binance is the Turkey is the second biggest country on Binance. Uh, okay. Coin market cap uh, visitors, most of the second or third highest coin market cap visitors uh, are from Turkey. You know, it's it's big in Turkey, but not specifically Bitcoin. Hmm. Because. So we also briefly Matt talked about this. The so you you say you like content in yeah South Africa about Bitcoin. It's mm. also the case for Turkey. Like and you know some a big portion of the population does not speak enough English or you know cannot understand like you know in depth articles or you know uh, the material that I can reach to are not accessible to them yeah because the content is uh yeah created in english and you know not and it's so much easier just to shill a new project that nobody knows about and you know like just wait for it to hype so people do marketing on that you know so not a lot of people spend time on bitcoin so i hope i mean i i wrote about this the other day this is not a fire drill anymore, you know, like, I mean, okay, two years ago, you could maybe play around, you know, gamble your money, yeah. buy some weird altcoins and do whatever you want. But right now, we may, yeah, we actually need Bitcoin and people should be aware of this, you know, because uh, he is, the present is decreasing the in, uh, interest rates at the moment, but we never know, like if one if one day he'll say, okay, like I'll just sell all your foreign exchange currencies at this price level or this or that. Yeah, people need to understand that their money is not their money. Yeah. And a yep. big portion of the population uh, unfortunately uses dollar as a store of value. It's also like a, a lot of countries actually do this, like you know all. Lebanon, for example, they also use it as a store of value, or Argentina, even you know. So yep. they people should also understand that dollars is not that much better than the Turkish lira. It's just yeah more established, you know, and has a fake backing by the petrol trade that's going on in the world. Yep. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, how many how many people are, are how many registered accounts are there on these crypto exchanges in Turkey? Just as a indication of how many people, and oh, is that number growing? In the in the uh, in the article, uh, I wrote the last data was from April, I think, and there were over five million registered people. But this is just the two big Turkish exchanges that I checked, and they are like couple more smaller ones and also on top of that there's a lot of people that use Binance so yeah like a big portion of the population uses cryptocurrency like even like even if they're not like using uh, cryptocurrencies people started to use Tether for example at some point because the government said there will be a one percent tax when you are buying dollars and one percent tax when you are selling dollars so yeah if you just bought teta you didn't have to pay that so it's yeah it's makes sense. And i think yeah it's like we are very fit for hyper bitcoinization in a way like the population yeah. is young we are like a little desperate at the moment with the turkish lira so yeah what's the population size of turkey 80 plus 5 million 
I'm yeah. saying plus five million because we have over four and a half million Syrian refugees at the moment, yeah. and oh, over five hundred thousand Afghanistan refugees. Yeah. Okay. So we're about we're about sixty sixty five million because we've also got about five million to seven million Zimbabwean refugees um, yeah. in South Africa. So yeah, we're about so a little bit smaller than Turkey. I mean, our latest data out of Treasury was two million um, crypto wallets um, across yeah. the exchanges. So proportionally a bit smaller than Turkey, but growing like very quickly. Oh yeah. You know? oh, yeah. Um, but the thing I mean, is, in South Africa, no one uses US dollar. Um, the rand, the rand is still a stable store of value, so no one uses US dollar. Um, so, and unlike Zimbabwe, which is obviously dollarized, um, and Mozambique, you know, so we we don't have that yet, but but it's catching on because inflation is picking up, and South Africans are going to be start looking, and we have the same issue, like you mentioned, like the the language barrier. So we have eleven national languages in South Africa. Everyone speaks speaks English, but like you know, there's a difference between speaking English. And then understanding a text in your yeah. home language and reading the, if you read the Bitcoin standard in Zulu as a Zulu person, it's going to make a lot more sense to you as a Zulu person than reading in English, you know? Sure. Um, so there's actually a, a South African based guy. Um, we've had him on the podcast a few episodes back who started an open source project called Exonumia. And it's all about trans translating Bitcoin works into African languages. So open source, anyone can contribute. You can come and <laughs> grab a, a, a work and translate it into Kosa, Zulu, Peri, Venda, Tsonga, whatever you want, yeah, um, you know, translate it and then get those, get those works out there. So, um, yeah, Kotsatsu at Exonumia is doing great work. We're a big fan of what they're doing. Um, I'll, because that's I'll key. You've got to get it in your native language. Oh, sorry. I'll what saying? Yeah. It's, I yeah. really appreciate those things because it's, it's necessary. Like, I know. Why do you talk about Bitcoin, for example, personally? Well, biggest thing for well for me is that I see central banking as being the biggest source of injustice in the world, because all you're doing is you're allowing one class of people to steal from everyone else. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, I believe that that theft is immoral. Um, and I know a lot of people kind of well, most people will agree with you and be like, "Yeah, theft's immoral," but when it comes down to it. Most people don't care so much. Um, just look around you in 2021, like how people bend their morals very easily. Like everyone's Austria. Now yeah. they're locking down the unvaccinated and people are like, oh, that's fine. Austria should fucking know better than doing that. You know, they've seen this shit before. Anyway, course, I digress. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like the, the thing with central banking is, is, is the root of all evil in this world. Because if you allow one group of people to create money out of nothing and then get interest on that money they've created out of nothing. They're just energy vampires that are sucking energy out of the system. Of course, um, yeah. And all they're doing is is ultimately leading that system to implode. And you but know what's the, also the problem? They suck the energy, but they personally cannot make good use of that energy too. They spend more right? energy to suck more energy, you know? It's not like they yeah. are more efficient or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the more they the, suck, the, the more they need to suck. You yeah. Know? Yeah. The more they suck, the more they suck. Right. Like it just compounds yeah. on itself. Like it's it's yeah. They suck and sucking. Anyway, it makes things infinitely worse for everyone. And and if there's a better system that can run honestly based on the sweat of your brow, proof of work, you know, which is what a gold standard was supposed to be, but that got mm -hmm. co-opted because as soon as they could do paper gold and they could centralize the gold stores, then the whole system implodes in itself and that's when i got orange pulled away from gold i was like oh hang on if some people can just get all the gold is one vault and then refuse audits you know like mm -hmm. the federal reserve or fort knox they're just not going to be audited because they, they say no and they have all the guns fort knox has no gold in it by the way Zero. if it had gold they would let you audit it yeah. obviously by them saying you can't come there's no gold you know, you should operate under that assumption. <laughs> I I call it Schrodinger's gold. You know, yeah. <laughs> or it's like any gold that's uh, sitting there as a reserve currency, you never know if it's there or not. You know, it's Schrodinger's gold. It's definitely Schrodinger's gold, but it's somewhere. So where is it? 
it's double spent somewhere or whatever, you know. It's definitely, it's de some of it is definitely double spent. But now this is the interesting part, right? Because us as Bitcoiners look at geopolitical game theory playing out and we're like, okay, so which country out of all of these dissenting countries here against the US dollar? Because make no mistake, there's a lot of countries that want to undermine the US dollar as reserve currency. Mm -hmm. But some of them might have bet on the horse of gold. If you're Russia or China, they've been accumulating yeah. gold massively, right? You know, Turkey did accumulate too at some point, like together with China and Russia. And actually, I have an article at Medium, like I wrote a long time ago, I'll send it to you. It's called 51% attack on fiat. You know, so what I was kind of thinking was like it would be gold and fiat, like, you know, trying to pull the ropes and Bitcoin winning it, you know. But I don't think it will exist anymore, like, because I don't think China will push gold narrative anymore. Like, they'll just go with the CBDC narrative, you know. But well, I think the CBDC narrative fits into China's, econo China's system of governance, their, their techno-fascism. And, you know, the term techno-fascism is a bit of a misnomer because fascism is always techno. It's always, yeah. you know, at the, at the point in time, it's always using technology, you know. But um, China that model of social credit score, you know, complete government control, that is just being emulated in the West. Mm -hmm. This is what, what, what breaks my brain when I look at what's happening in the West is just how easily they roll over. So that tells me that this whole thing of, you know, suspending, suspending the constitution for a state of emergency, mm -hmm. which is every, every month in South Africa, they renew the state of emergency and then the constitution yeah. is suspended. You know, I, I don't know if it's happening in Turkey the same, but I presume so because it's that's to be what the same I was. You know, I told you that he wants cows, uh, with messing up with the money. He wanted like a state of maybe that's what I was thinking. Maybe he just wants to get a state of emergency and just extend his period or whatever. You know, Instead because of effectively one... he's a he's a king now, right? If there's a state of emergency, Parliament's suspended. He's a king. Yeah, 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 and so. So they want that 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 state of emergency. So suspension of of uh, the constitution across mm -hmm. the entire West. You know, um, like what does that tell you? Like they're trying to emulate that Chinese model. Well, I mean, when you go down that rabbit hole, what's the answer to this? Obviously, mass recall of all politicians in every country across the world. All of them purged out. Get them the fuck out of here because they can't be trusted. None of them. Not the opposition. None of them because. They just rolled over and let this happen. But like, how does Western uh, values and traditions and civilization and the individualism and all of that, they just flush that all down the toilet in the face of a virus with a 99% survival rate, you know? And that's very, like, that's the Chinese playbook. 99.98%. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that, yeah. yeah it's... So, so, so South Africa is in the news right now because one of our scientists discovered the Omicron, Omicron by, uh, variant. Um, in South Africa, and they were dumb enough to fucking report it because then everyone shut down flights to South Africa, you know? Um, whether that's the reality of what's actually happening or not, I don't know. But, I mean, it, I just got some... Was it this lady yeah. that discovered it? <clears throat> or someone else? I saw a woman uh, talking about Omicron, and she's like, oh, it's just a mild virus. Like, it, it, it's a wild, mild version yeah. of the virus. You know, it's like not a big yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, she's, she's right, though. So, so my background is evolutionary biology. So oh, I, okay. I studied evolutionary biology. And, and one of the things about a virus, right, is that if a virus becomes more virulent, so it spreads more easily, mm -hmm. it becomes more contagious, it also becomes less deadly. Like it's a trade-off mm -hmm. between yes. deadliness and the way it spreads. So if the variant can spread more rapidly, that means it's going to be mm -hmm. less deadly. And yes. if it's more deadly, it's going to spread less rapidly because it kills people faster than it can spread. You know, that's yeah. one of the reasons why Ebola hasn't gotten out of West Africa because it kills people too fast kills. to get the yeah. fuck out of West Africa. It's you know? also with the Delta variant, though. It was mild compared to the initial cases. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, I didn't study uh, evolutionary biology, but I played this game Pandemic or yeah. something. It was an Android game. I played it like, I don't know, 2016 or 17, you know? Yeah. Was my favorite game to play at the airport, waiting for something or in the toilet or whatever, you know. And yeah, yeah if you kill too fast, you don't survive as a virus because yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And while we're on this point, like, so, so this concept of like the virus variants mutating in the unvaccinated, obviously I've got to be in my bonnet about this because this fucking medical apartheid bullshit has got to stop. But from an evolutionary perspective, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's just bullshit. It's obviously just the news saying it. If you speak to any credible scientist, they'll tell you this is fucking bullshit. Because the only way that a new variant can dominate the population in, in such a way as like you've got, let's take Delta because Omicron, like whatever, you know, but but Delta, the only way it can spread to be 100% of the population is that there has to be a selective pressure that is mm-hmm. acting on all the other variants. Because if you take a population of, of viruses, there's a bunch of variants, thousands of variants that mull about in like 0.1% of the population, you know, per variant. Mm-hmm. You know, they all mull about. If one variant becomes antibiotic resistant like let's talk about because it makes more sense to talk about uh super bugs in a hospital you know but yeah. uh, so bacteria yeah. bacteria if yeah. you are if you are just do- dosing everyone with antibiotics and one variant randomly gen- generates a gene sequence that makes it resistant to that that antibiotic it can keep propagating mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. going to survive and all the other variants strains yeah. are going to be killed out and it's exactly sure. the same with a vaccine. If you're giving a vaccine to a bunch of people and it's not stopping transmission, so in other words, it's still being... The one that survives... The one that survives is going to propagate through it. So by giving a vaccine that is leaky, that is causing, that is allowing uh, the vaccine, oh, the vaccine, the virus to still spread, you're not killing it. You're killing off all of its competition and then it starts dominating. So there's no way that this can be happening in unvaccinated people it's just pure propaganda which you know makes me worry because this is being parroted by all the same media houses at the same time which makes me think there's an unseen force behind this because it's not just the media that's parroting the line you know it's the world economic forum that's saying we need to do this it's the bill gates and and the who saying all singing off the same hymn sheet and all roads lead to cbdc Uh, yeah yeah, yeah. So, uh, I digress, but it's bullshit. Sorry, I've got a cat here. Oh, yeah. It's a baby one, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's little, a... like a three of them. Little yeah. Kitten, yeah. Oh. It's a very cute one. That's a nice one. Oh, man. I, oh, God. I had a, I spent two and a half million Satoshis last year <laughs> because I was driving and this crazy cat jumped in front of my car. <laughs> And I was going like, do you use, you use miles over there, right? Or kilometers? No, kilometers. kilometers. I, I was going like maybe 80 kilometers an hour and I hit him. He survived. Whoa. Yeah. And that cat must have been on Ivermectin, bro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. So, you know, uh, I took him to the vet and he had to get a platinum surgery. Thank God that Turkey is a cheap place. Like a hip surgery on a, of a cat costed me two and a half million satoshis, which will be a fortune one day. But you know, was rather okay. You know, if it happened in somewhere else, would be goodbye, cat. I'm sorry, I cannot pay this much to fix you or whatever. Yeah. Two and a half um, million satoshis. That's that's twenty five thousand rand. Yeah. Yeah. So we on that point, we actually hit uh, cent sat parity recently yes, in South Africa. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, so I, one cent yeah. is one satoshi. Good. Have you guys had that in Turkey yet? Not yet, not yet. Uh, we soon. need like soon. We need a couple more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need like fifteen plus, like you guys have. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Don't worry. It'll be coming to a country near you soon. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so it's crazy though. Like you know, like when people were expecting all-time highs last year. I already had mine. Like I had 15 all-time highs before everybody asked. It. You know, it's like uh, this is too boring. I don't care about it anymore. You know, but yeah. now I kind of feel like I'm torn between the 58k gang <laughs> and the prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but, but those guys are funny though. Like. It's, uh, yeah, man. You know, for me, the least interesting thing about Bitcoin is the price. The price. You know? Like the yes. longer I, the longer I stay in it, the because we've got a very serious fucking problem to solve here, which is yes. CBDCs. You know, so in South Africa, um, 
we've got these oppressed minority groups in South Africa who historically held power, right? Zulus so, or? No, 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 no. So Afrikaans oh. people. Afrikaans, okay. So, yeah. so in South Africa, Afrikaans people used to be, in, they used to run the apartheid government, right? Mm -hmm. So they were in charge like 30 years ago. And then end of apartheid, they lost political power. And what's really interesting about, about Afrikaans people in South Africa is apartheid was effectively national socialism. It was it was Nazism without without the Jew killing. Um, so it was a slight slight improvement on Nazism in that regard. But the the economic system was national socialism, but only for Afrikaans, uh, a few and, and some other white people, but predominantly for Afrikaans white people. Uh -huh. And um, it, the government created jobs. They held all these public work programs, and then they employed Afrikaans people. But what was interesting that was tracking. First world countries, white people in first world countries, their standard of living improved under a free market sort of laissez faire. And we're not, it's not quite but more free market than South Africa's was. Their standard of living improved way more than white people in South Africa. Obviously, black people in South Africa during apartheid had a horrific time. It was terrible. Um, yeah. You know, their standard of living, you know, didn't improve much at all. But even the system where the government is trying their best to create a a preferred class that gets all the benefit, all the like is the beneficiary of this largesse, it still didn't outperform the free market. Like they still did worse. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so apartheid ended, all these Afrikaans white people were out of a job. Uh, they weren't working for the railways and the, and the ports and the government anymore. Um, and now they had to make a plan and they were ostracized by the new government because they were like, you were the previous oppressors and you know, they got, mm -hmm. got the boot. So they had to go and become entrepreneurs. So you had this whole class of people. So it was the, then you saw this massive jump in the standard of living and quality of life for that group mm -hmm. because they had to become free market orientated. But year so over year, you, it's massive jump. Like over the long yeah. term, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think so, year so, over year, metrics are kind of like weird in a way. You know, they don't tell you, the, show you the whole picture. Well, interestingly, in South Africa, obviously, we've got a lot of racial diversity. So we've got a, the biggest, second biggest Indian population outside of India is in Durban in South Africa, hmm. in the world. So we've got like, and it's, it's mainly concentrated in Durban. So it's like on the east coast of uh, North South Africa, very high population of, of Durbans, uh, of Indians. They have, they have increased their GDP per capita by racial group, the most out of any group in South Africa since apartheid hmm. ended. And they've got no handouts from the government back then or now. So they've just been free market hustling the whole time. So they've actually increased the moment. But but we have this in in South Africa at the moment. We've got the ANC running the show, um, which is a essentially a black nationalist party, you know, where in, in reality on the ground, um, where they've got these affirmative action uh, regulations they put in place. We have to hire, you know, black people regardless of the quality of the work they do, et cetera, et cetera. It's affirmative action, right? Um, but mm. for the for the majority, but obviously it doesn't benefit the majority. It benefits the small one percent of that ruling elite. Of um, course. But then you have these ostracized groups. So you've got this group of Afrikaans people who are ostracized uh, economically, um, but not not so much economically, but politically they're ostracized. <laughs> so what I, I see happening, they are already established, right? They are already at yeah. a level, so yeah. they are not. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and they hold a lot. They hold a large amount of wealth, not the vast majority, but they hold a large amount of wealth. Not the not the largest amount of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, the ruling elite holds the most. So, but they hold a large amount of money. Um, but they're slowly being cut out of the economy. So this is where I see big potential for Bitcoin is in this specific demographic, because um, they are persona non grata to the government, and they will be the first people. The government will be like, you're unvaccinated, you cannot partake in this culture anymore. And they're also the type of people who'll be like, fine, fuck yeah. you. Like, we'll do it ourselves. Because that's the Afrikaner culture is very much one of like, we'll do it ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. If you know anything about South African history, like that's how they are. Uh, they're disagreeable. Um, and I can say that because I grew up Afrikaans in an Afrikaans community. But anyway, the point I'm making is that you've but got after you know, that, four million of them. The control of the money with CBDCs and you know and so so, so these order. so these guys will be excluded from that and this is why Bitcoin is such a such a great opportunity 
for this demographic and obviously anyone in South Africa should grab Bitcoin with both hands and stack as hard as you can because inflation CBDCs are coming. Um, doesn't matter what racial group you're in, but there's certain groups that are being oppressed and targeted by the government specifically. Um, and, and those groups should, should gravitate towards that first, you know, um, it makes sense. They will, you might end up in a situation where that group once again, ends up with all the financial power and 50 years, a hundred years from now, you have another apartheid situation because they've just gotten so rich and they can do it again. I don't know. Game theory is interesting. We'll see where it goes, but, and, and, and this is where the whole globalist thing comes in. Like, they think they've got it figured out and they think that they can impose their top-down um, control, but the system is so complex and so dynamic and ever-shifting that, you know, will they be able to pull it off? It's like the Asimov's book, Foundation. The psycho history to, to, to make it, like, it's impossible to predict the future and act upon it because the second you start to act upon it, the future changes, you know, so... Right? Yeah. Yep. So it's yep. just doesn't work it just delays things like you know like 2008 crisis was delayed but it's still here you know it didn't end it's here it with the vengeance yeah yeah uh, it's, it's here with a bit with the <laughs> with with even more energy with even more potential energy stored behind it right yes right, i mean yeah. what what was qe in 2008 they did like 700 million or 700 billion yeah was they were like it was huge for that time. Now we're doing yeah. two, three trillion. Yeah, they just print platinum coins right and left or whatever, you know. Uh, I can't I can't believe they did that. You know, like you I know thought the meme so you know what's so funny though, actually? Uh the Federal Reserve branch that mints the coins lost 150 million dollars like last year. Because for example, what? costs two cents to print uh, mint uh, one cent coin you know yeah or it costs okay. like 35 cents to yeah mint a 25 cent uh, to yeah mint a quarter and at some point steve munchin was saying guys please bring your you know coins back into circulation we need them blah 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 you know and i think it's just so funny it reminded me of this like south park episode where everybody becomes a beggar and is asking for change, you know, like yeah, that was like Steve Munchin, you know, change, like, yeah, change, yeah. But the whole system is so much. it's so fucking ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, and like it, it's becoming painfully obvious for everyone to see now. Well, everyone has eyes because not everyone's seeing, obviously. You know, some people are not going to make it. It's just how it is, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But for people to see. And, and for people around the world to, to see. And I think countries like ours are, you know, the canaries in the coal mine. Because um, yeah. it's not going to be the U.S. that implodes first. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. be, it's going to happen in the colonies first. It's going to happen in the periphery. Um, and, you know, where where does that happen? Argentina, South and Africa, the, the lower end of the G20, you know. And, you know, like when we hear those things happen, like we hear other things like riots and this and that and people don't focus on why they happen but what's actually because news you know news are always more attractive to some part of the population i don't know why but you know yeah. uh, it's like you hear about th things about places like for example i was in el salvador for the bitcoin week adopting bitcoin conference which was yeah amazing you know yeah uh, you know, before going to El Salvador, like even my dad was like sending me stuff from WhatsApp. It's like, oh, look, this is a dangerous country. Be careful and this and that. But you go there. OK, you know, like there are some regions that are dangerous, but yeah. that's the same in everywhere. Like, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, other than that, I was pretty safe there. And what I hate, for example, the most about the COVID stuff is that People were traveling a lot recently, hmm. you know, like especially like a lot of Americans were going to Europe or India or Africa or everywhere, you know, and they would they were seeing the world with their own eyes instead of like, you know, seeing it through a lens of a media company or whatever, you know. So uh, with the travel restrictions, that is something I think 
that we are going to lose. Like people will choose convenience and go shorter distances and like, you know, which I'm sad about because for example, yeah. you know, I don't know how it is with you, but like some people are like, oh, for example, my friend came to Turkey last, uh, this summer before he flew to Miami for the conference because you had to stay out of EU for two mm. weeks before going to the States. And he spent two weeks in Turkey and his family was also concerned. It's like, yeah, well, maybe you should not go there, go somewhere else to go to the Caribbeans or whatever, you know, but it's fine here at the moment or, you know, it was fine yeah. here for a while, but you know, now yeah, he'll come again and, you know, next winter or uh, next summer, he'll be here too. And then me and my girlfriend will visit him and his girlfriend over in France and you know things change once we are actually there hearing and seeing is different yeah big time um what i what i worry about though is that maybe maybe the globalists and the governments have realized that they can't control the movement of capital anymore because bitcoin exists and you can't stop that what they can control is the physical movement of people because mm -hmm. for the sovereign individual thesis to play out it requires the free movement of people between jurisdictions. So you can play that jurisdictional arbitrage. But if you can have movement licenses on people and restrict it to a certain class of people that, have, that are compliant, hmm. that say, okay, government, we, we accept that you are the boss and you control our bodies. We effectively are your slaves because you can put whatever you want into us without us having any say over the matter. That then creates a class of people that then has proven allegiance and they can move and the rest can't move. And that group that can't move, they're the rabble rousers from a government's perspective, right? They're the fucking difficult ones who are going to be the Bitcoiners. Um, yeah. Because I don't know about you, but when I look at Bitcoiners, I see a large amount of people who are non-compliant. Um, I mean, like you know, I told you, the friends that I was not able to orange peel properly were yeah. the more compliant ones. Because yeah, exactly. they are worried, like, what would happen if my government says you cannot spend this, you know, or whatever. Like, you know, they are worried about it. Like, yeah. But for me, like, the more Bitcoiners I meet, like, I'm like, okay, whatever, you know. Like, the only people I want to spend my money with is Bitcoiners. If I can do yeah. business with you, I would prefer to do business with you because yeah. uh, you... I mean, we have a similar mindset at some point, you know, it's not like. Yeah. 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 And that's why the circular economy Bitcoin thing is so important. And mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't understand this a few years ago, um, but now I see it as being very important because we didn't have the same forces acting on us, but now we're being forced to trans because we're going to be cut out of the financial system. If we remain uncompliant, um, mm -hmm. the writings on the wall, you know, and I say it now, um, but I'm pretty sure that in a few years' time, it'll be commonplace that people will be cut out of the financial system for not for not um, not being compliant with the government. And then we're going to have to build a circular Bitcoin economy. So we better get building, guys, because you know yeah. it's coming. And you and know, we interviewed a um, give up. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, so I interviewed a regenerative farmer um, last week who who raises grass fed beef here in South Africa, and he's just started accepting Bitcoin for his beef. So he grows like the best beef in the country no hormones it's like it's good for the environment you know there's they're grass fed they don't get fed any bullshit and he's accepting bitcoin so now all of a sudden bitcoin is like okay cool i can get the best quality protein in the country and we already have good meat in south africa but now i can get the best quality protein for my sats brilliant that's one less thing i have to worry about now you know and i'm supporting a farmer who's supporting the earth and like fixing things not fucking things up it's great it's that low time preference thinking you know I and mean, okay. we've got to form these associations and start start spending our sets with where it matters, you know, with people, uh -huh. people who deserve it. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, like uh, we were in El Salvador and there was this friend from Norway and he roasts coffee. So, and he sells coffee with Bitcoin, you know, and he's teaching people how to do it as well. So he's getting a good community over there. So we visited some plantations together uh, in El Salvador and he wants to import coffee beans from El Salvador and pay them in Bitcoin because 
you know, he's kind of on a Bitcoin standard and he doesn't want to sell his Bitcoin he, because when he sells, he'll have to pay capital gains taxes. Now he won't have to do it, you know, so it's circular economy actually works. Yeah, it does. But it only works when the pressure is applied from outside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because in a, in a normal system that fun you okay in a normal system you wouldn't need bitcoin i say normal mm -hmm. in a fiat system that functions semi-responsibly we wouldn't need bitcoin because the yeah. the theft is kind of tolerable but it's getting to intolerable levels you know i mean to tolerable it's not not to tolerable for me you know but it's yeah. funny you know at some point when i was younger i was like well maybe we should have a different democratic voting system you know maybe younger people should have a higher coefficient at voting you know because when you think about it you already live mm. in a circum uh, in the conditions that somebody else voted yeah for years and years you know yeah and let's say i'm 18 years old and the average lifespan in turkey is 78 years old I have still 60 more years in this country or in yeah. this world, basically, you know, so I was thinking of all these things and how it, it would be mathematically fair also if the younger would get a higher coefficient, blah, blah, blah. And the problem then, is young people are fucking stupid. <laughs> no, no, it, everybody is stupid in a way. You know? Yeah. Okay. That's I mean, <laughs> was, uh, And also it would having coefficients make it more dynamic. So the new generation would be different than the older one. And, you know, it's blah, blah, blah. Because the problem I see is that people in Turkey, especially, if they make a political decision, they hold on to it forever. Hmm. You know? It's the nature of power, right? Yeah, I mean, they, are, they, they support it like they support football teams, you know? <laughs> So yeah, if you were stupid that young, <laughs> you stay stupid all the time. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, true. Uh, true. People don't change their political decisions that frequently. You know, which is yeah, yeah. You know. Well, I mean, I think it's being forced upon people now. A lot of people are waking up to see the world for what it is, and this is why these disenfranchised people all around the world, like we need to start working towards a circular Bitcoin standard amongst ourselves first you know so what we're trying to do here in south africa um is we're trying to form a community of bitcoiners first just to get people talking and like today we put together the baseline document i say we one of my mm -hmm. friends is also an author for, for bitcoin magazine put together a baseline document of like a memorandum of understanding to form a you know like an organization a very loose organization mm -hmm. of people who want to further bitcoin in africa you know so one of the guys that are involved, um, we spoke about earlier, but um, is, is uh, Arman from um, the Surfer Kids. And he started mm -hmm. Bitcoin Ikasi, which yeah. is essentially trying to copycat Bitcoin Beach from El Salvador, but in South Africa, because it's a model that started with one dude walking up the beach oh, in yeah. El Zonte, telling people about Bitcoin. And now the whole country's on a Bitcoin standard, you know, like True. the yeah. power is, is, is significant. So, so what, what, um, Harman is trying to achieve there is through personal responsibility and surf coaching, get kids from the township surfing, then teach them about personal responsibility. So show up every day. If you don't show up every day, you're out of the surfing academy. <laughs> oh, that's good. Cool. That's yeah. interesting. So if you don't, yeah. yeah, man, that this is the key to what he does. If you don't show up, you know, four days a week, you're out. Like, wow. that's it. You know, Lambda and, School, for example. Yeah. Do you know Lambda School? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like that. They look for consistency, for example, because, you know, if you are consistent... Most important things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what Herman is doing now with these guys is like, they come for years, they learn to surf. Then after four or five years, they become a coach. And now mm -hmm. he's paying the coaches in Bitcoin. But he's paying their salaries in fiat and he's giving them essentially a 25%, so like a bonus in, mm -hmm. in Bitcoin. And then, but they all are... Uh, Kosa speakers, so indigenous language speakers in, in, in that region. And they go back to the township where they live and they are onboarding the vendors. Because yeah, one well, of the biggest things is, Herman, like you must understand, in South Africa, 11 national languages, like very culturally diverse. As a white guy, you know, you can't have the savior complex to go uh -huh. into a township to be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that. That's, that shit doesn't work, you know? So 
he's like hands off. He's like, he pays the coaches and sets. And he's like, listen, guys, if you want to go and onboard vendors in your local community who will accept your sets, please do. And in fact, I might like help you out some more sets if you do. And they've got three vendors on board already um, in, in a couple nice. of months. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's exponential. But these kids, he's like, he's never seen them so stoked. They love surfing, but they're more stoked on Bitcoin, you know, because <laughs> they, the penny is dropping. So yeah, they're doing yeah. absolutely phenomenal work there. Anyone listening to this, if you want to get involved in the surfer kids, like call up Adman, get involved, send some sats over there. Um, and also like they need resources, not just Bitcoin. Not, we don't need sats. They need, we need experience from other Bitcoiners who know how to do this stuff. You know, we need guys who know how to work lightning to come in and help and do workshops on how to set up, you know, lightning terminals, run your own nodes, all that stuff, um, get adoption in the, in the, in the township stores. But yeah, it's, it's happening, man. It's, it's happening. It's very exciting to see. And that can yeah. change. This can change people's lives because same as El Salvador in South Africa, if you live in a township, you don't own any assets that appreciate in value with inflation. You don't own the shack you live in. Um, you don't own, definitely don't own stocks. You don't own bonds. The only thing you own is some cash savings, which yeah. is depreciating because of inflation. So Just Bitcoin around. is the only way. Yeah. Like Bitcoin is the only way that these guys, if they can save a hundred rand a month over five years, can actually claw their way out of poverty. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important work. Um, yeah. So it, uh, it's, it's very exciting to see it happen. And, um, yeah, we, we trying to support as much as we can. And, and obviously with the podcast is just creating awareness. So guys all over the world can get involved. And over the last week, I spoke to Hadman this morning. So many yeah. guys have been messaging him, you know, to try to get involved all over the world, which is amazing. Yeah, I don't know how, but like last week I saw them and I started to follow them. Maybe it was through your retweet or something, you know. And yeah, I well, did some small support and it's I like that uh, spirit. And really yeah. appreciate it. And actually, after the Ezonte story, uh, I also looked at wave surfing in Turkey. Oh, my puppy is here. Finny, do you want to say hi? Yeah, let's see him. It's, his name hey. is Finny. <laughs> oh, man. It's like I was going to get a different dog because I have, I'm very allergic. But yeah. then... My low time preference didn't let me do that. And then he came up to my door two days after I looked for some and I get him for free, basically. Yeah, he and knocks so, on the right door, eh? Yeah, he literally was like shivering and freezing on the drain, like actually, yeah, oh, 53 weeks ago or something. Like last week this year, I found him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any dog that walks into a Bitcoiner's home is going to be fed steak and steak and sats, bro. He's going to be yeah, well looked yeah. after. <laughs> He's not going to be eating Beyond Meat burgers, that's for sure. No. <laughs> no, so huh, I was saying, so I started to look for surfing, wave surfing spots in Turkey. Yeah. Just not because I want to recreate uh, the Bitcoin Beach project, because actually the Turkish president banned Bitcoin payments in Turkey. You know. We ban people from Bitcoin payments. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. And yeah. not actual people too, or not actual Bitcoiners were banned, you know. I just, yeah. Anyhow, so uh, I found this small village uh, close to Istanbul. And yeah, like this guy moved up there 12 years ago and started a surfing school. And like, you know, his daughter is the uh, Turkish woman surfing champion now and like he's a good surfer and they start to train uh, younger kids like for example the shepherd of the village is a professional surfer now it's amazing. Know? and there's this guy he makes surfboards and he literally makes them in a chicken coop yeah so may he he has a project where he wants to raise some money so that he could teach the kids in the village how to make surfboards hmm. and you know all that stuff and it's interesting maybe you can also talk to Arman. what was the... Arman. Arman, yeah. yeah Arman about yeah making boards together with the kids or oh maybe yeah. we could even i could also talk to my friend and may, maybe you could share some know-how and teach each other yeah it could be good you well know? there's 
there's a lot of surfboard shapers in South Africa. I'm sure we can find some who can teach some kids in Turkey how to do it. Now, is, well, is that surfing? Is that it, a... oh, there, there's a friend of mine that I found after I looked for the surfing school. He is doing uh, surfboards. And he so he's making them? To, yeah, he's making it. He wants to buy some extra material, give it to the kids so they can start yeah. doing themselves and... Yeah. Right. So is this is this on the Mediterranean coast of the of Turkey or on the Black Sea side? Black Sea side. The Black Sea. So there's surf in the Black Sea. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like one or two spots, like it's very yeah. small at the moment. But I yeah. mean, windsurfing was small in Turkey like 30 years ago, but now it's kind of big, especially mm. in my city. There's this yeah. place called Alacete. It's very famous for surfing. Okay. Okay, and kite surfing obviously is probably big as well. Yes, I imagine. yes, yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's not yeah. bad also. But you know, Bitcoin is interesting. Like I always say, this thanks to Bitcoin. Like we are having this chat, for example. Yeah, I can learn about what you go through in life and what I'm going through in life. I can share it with you know people in Africa, and yeah, it, it's very similar things and. You don't have the inflation yet, but once you have it, you will understand that Bitcoin actually helps you keep your sanity, you know, because yeah. for, we have, I told you, we have dairy cows and normally the price of milk uh, was adjusted to be one and a half kilograms of feed, you know, mm. uh, but uh, the minimum milk prices are like uh, are announced like every six months or a year, you know, like it changes. But till two days ago, it was down to a, a liter of milk would only get you 0.8 kilograms of a feed. Animal feed, which means that every farmer was losing money, you know. It's not sustainable, yeah. Yeah, you need to have a war chest to keep it, like. I just heard yeah. about someone today, they have 1,200 dairy cows. They will close the facility, send the animals to the slaughterhouse, you know, because yeah. it costs them more to feed them. And it's, it's getting yeah. really stupid. Yeah. But so we somehow get along because we adopted the Bitcoin standard and can survive the hardship, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. like having having a Bitcoin standard or at least a partial Bitcoin standard in your business, in your personal life gives you resilience because you've got mm -hmm. these savings that are not being debased over the long term. Because all of us function on a long time scale, you know, our lives yeah, are not two year cycles. I mean, a saving a saving that's not debased uh, teaches you to save. Right. Like, Makes it addictive. I was a horrible <laughs> saver, but I'm not kidding. Like. Two years ago, I live in this city called Izmir, and it's not a very cold place. And two years ago, uh, my neighbors had so much heat on that was living under me. I, I said, oh, fuck it. I'm not going to turn heat on. I'll just stack more sets, you know? It, yeah. I wouldn't do it if it was any other way, you know? So I just wear two hoodies, stack more yeah. sets. Yeah, I didn't even have to wear two hoodies or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Eat more meat, stack more sets. Yeah. yeah. But so I think I was listening. Um, I was actually driving along the coast at my house. It was last December. I remember listening to the podcast um, to Tales from the Crypt. I think you were you were chatting to Marty on Tales from the Crypt. And you were talking about having gone through hyperinflation yourself. Having seen it. Uh, well, not hyperinflation, but having seen an inflationary event previously in your life. Maybe I'm confusing who I was listening to. But I think it was Yeah, you. I think it was uh, Princey. Ah. or John Wallace. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. anyway, the point being, but you going through inflation now, like what, what, what words of wisdom do you have for South Africans who we're not quite there yet, but it's coming. Like what, how would you tell them to prepare for an inflationary event? Like what can they do? Well, so depends on, you know, who you are basically, because like, okay, if you if you are a computer or if you are a coder for example and you need a new device get it before the inflation or whatever you know because the, the, this is the interesting thing like unfortunately uh, money 
affects how we behave, you know, like, so for mm -hmm. example, uh, I want to buy a cell phone, let's say, you know, uh, let's say, which never happens for me, I just buy a cheap one with the long lasting battery, but, you know, <laughs> let's say uh, I want to buy an, uh, buy an iPhone 11 or whatever, you know, and it's uh, 1000 Turkish liras, let's say, you know, I want to have it as soon as possible because, uh, you know, two weeks later, it could be uh, 1,200 Turkish liras, you know. It would cost me more in Turkish liras. Uh, right now, it's easier for people to manage this, but, like, this was harder to manage in, like, 30 years ago when digital banking wasn't there and this was, and people didn't have access to things, you know. You had the Turkish there, and that's what you had. And if you got debased, oh well, you know, you just got debased. Stucks, yeah. 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 So, but for example, uh, let's say a German person who has euros could be like, well, I'll just wait for the next model to come up so that this iPhone 11 will be cheaper. And, you know, in the meantime, I can save my money somewhere, you know. But. Okay. The bad quality of money makes you literally follow your high time preference things, or else you always live with a FOMO, you know, fear of missing out because of debasement yeah. or something. And like, that's why I think there's like a kind of big uh, shit coiner in Turkey because people always have the FOMO of missing out on things, you know. So once they see hypes and hype cycles, they just jump on them, you know. But I would suggest people to do is like to basically do their own research. Uh, I did mine for thousands of hours. You probably did yours for thousands of hours too. And we chose to be on Bitcoin and I, I don't really care about anything else. The, one of the reasons is that I want to spend my time on more productive things than following hype cycles everywhere, left and right. I just but stack, um, but stack more. Solana is gonna flip ETH. It's coming, right? You need to get yeah. in on Solana. <laughs> Cardano is gonna win, right? I mean, the worst case, they can reset it and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but that's always the shit coin thing. It's like there's always you know, something new, you know. I want the, the thing is that your money should not cause anxiety in you. Yes. Exactly. You know, like we already have too many things to worry about. Like money should not be an anxiety like issue. Like it should just yeah, you know, help you relax and live a better life and you know, spend more time for yourself and with the family and friends. So yeah. Yeah. When you are chasing weird projects, you don't know what will happen to them. They are not battle tested, and it's like mm, flying on a B737 Max that was engineered by Indian engineers who were paid $9 an hour. And that planes were just falling, you know, and I don't want to fly in that one. I just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Give me that Airbus. Pay those high paid French workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. crazy. No, yeah, like I know. You know, yeah. they, they paid nine dollars and, you know, like I, it's not about Indian engineers, Indians even run Twitter now. Well, well you know, they run everything. But I'm, the, the, my point was like it's the outsourcing of cheap labor and, you know, it's, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Go. If you, you know, inflation is already a risky environment i would uh, suggest people to get the best risk reward asset which is bitcoin for me like it's battle tested has been fought for a long time and you know and the worst case you know uh, you have bitcoin bitcoiners to trade your bitcoins with you know because right yeah yeah they are the people i want to deal with for example so yeah yeah and tell me, so so Erdogan uh, banned cryptocurrencies. He said they're fighting a war against cryptocurrencies. Um, what effect has that ban had in reality on the ground in, in Turkey? Uh, the payment bans 
like well there were too many places that took bitcoin payments you know mm. so it wasn't too important like it wasn't a big shift in things you know like people were not using bitcoin to make payments but mm. uh, yeah it could accelerate slowly but i still think bitcoin payments would not be that early in turkey because lightning is not known to not known by the masses like you know mm. exchanges mm. don't have a lot of incentives to explain lightning and mm. yeah but what about exchanges yeah. do they did they shut down exchanges or, or the no, ramps or how do they no, you can buy and hold it or you can sell your cryptocurrencies you are not allowed to sell goods and services with them ah okay so, so they want speculate. to they want to to stop like uh, monetization or you know or slow okay. down the monetization part of it but okay i see <laughs> the interesting thing is that uh, the bitcoin prices went 2x two times since the president announced the war on bitcoin <laughs> in turkish lira so and what so so there's a big premium in turkey compared to the rest of the world no no, no no premium the turkish lira is the reason of just the, the turkish lira yeah yeah okay okay okay, okay. i okay. i always, so you, i sometimes say this like there are still people that sell me bitcoin or turkish lira which is a big luxury you know yeah same for yeah, you it is. it is there are people who sell for rent but you know not to be a hypocrite i sell bitcoin too because I live on Bitcoin standard. Like I take, yeah. I use my credit card. I take some cash advance at the end of the month. I sell some Bitcoin. I pay my stuff. Next month I get paid. I buy Bitcoin again. So it's the circle yeah. in which I yeah. have to buy and and sell. It, every month, every month you just accumulate more sets. The little, the, the surplus mm -hmm. you just accumulate. That's mm. that's the goal, you know. Yeah. I don't yeah, care yeah, about yeah. the dollar value of. The bitcoin like the current dollar value it's yeah, yeah more exactly. sets and you know maybe exactly. yeah yeah it's my yep. unit of account yeah yeah and that's it you get the thing is people think that it requires active government to get a uh, bitcoin standard in a country and that's the way that it went in, in, in el salvador but actually the way it's going to progress through the world is a grassroots movement individuals oh. adopting it then moving uh, up that way for me, I was in El Salvador and I think, yeah, education is a must there. So few people are actually aware of Bitcoin. Some people are afraid mm. of it because of problems with the Chiba wallet they had, the government yeah. wallet, because <clears throat> it's not perfectly functioning. So, yeah, yeah I hope uh, they managed to teach the locals or the actual El Salvadoran people about Bitcoin. Otherwise, you know, other Bitcoiners will go into El Salvador, take advantage of the stuff, and they will have a far superior money. Like, you know, when the British yep. went to Africa and to Ghana, athletes, you know, or... Yes, yes, exactly. It will be the situation like that if people don't... And they'll have high inflation because, you know... So it should yeah. be a, like a grassroots movement and more education is like a, de definitely a must. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Stackmo, I think we're going to wrap it up there for the night. Yeah. Um, tell me, where can people track you down if they want to find your work? Uh, the, I know you write quite a bit in Bitcoin Magazine. Where can they find you on Twitter, socials, etc.? cetera? Uh, well, you can. I only use Twitter. Uh, it's 1971 bubble. Uh, yeah, it's referencing to the Nixon shock when he stopped. Yeah, he, he started printing fiat basically out of thin air. Yeah, so people can find me there. And I have only one article on Bitcoin magazine. It was a yeah, fun one to write and was in a good timing because since I wrote that, so many things have happened and Turkish era just is collapsing. So it was a good yeah thing to put it up there and try to explain why this is happening to more people yeah yeah and right was very nice chatting with you so 
Thank you very much. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we definitely want to do it again soon. Um, and I think uh, hopefully we don't we don't have the conversation when South Africa is having high inflation. But unfortunately, yeah. I think that's probably going to be the case. But so it goes. We're on a Bitcoin standard. It's not our, it's not our fault that the government's being retarded is what it is. Before we finish this, uh, you know, I asked you why you try you spend time to explain Bitcoin. I don't do it for myself or I don't do it for Bitcoin. I actually feel sad for people who are losing their yeah. purchasing powers. And it's like, uh, this is going to sound like cheesy, but, you know, every time I manage to orange peel someone, I feel like uh, Schindler from Schindler's List. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. Like, I feel like saving them basically. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. So. And then you see, so, so I've got a few people, um, that I've orange pulled over the years and I, some of them now are more hardcore Bitcoiners than I am, you know, and yeah. I, I see them and I'm like, this is amazing. And they're orange pulling people and like the, the movement grows and you never know the person that you orange pull, if they're just going to run with it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to see. It's great. And people pay, pay that forward for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. I think Bitcoiners do, cause it's a bit of a cult, you know, like we can't help but talk about it. Um, <laughs> you've got that yeah. religious fervor about us, you know, and it, it's, <laughs> it's contagious. Yeah. Oh man. Well, it was very nice yeah. chatting with you and you too, yeah. man. We'll chat okay. soon. Have yeah. a good evening. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Cheers.